without this thing. I don't know why it doesn't. Oh, it's working now. Okay. Well, I want to welcome you. Uh, this is the second edition of the Ask the Pastor. Uh, we had a, a session last year in which a lot of questions were asked. And, you know, we really appreciate the questions that came in. Uh, you know, always, it's always fun to get to, to test the pastor, you know. The, the, the thing is that he always has the answer. That's really, you know. <laughs> uh, except for, I, I'm not allowed to ask one question, but that's okay. Um, so let's go ahead and let's, let's jump to it here. And you, it, for those of you in your bulletin, uh, I think that we have five of the questions listed there. And so if you want to keep notes, there's a couple of places that I know I'm going to. Um, so let's start with the first question, Pastor. How did Daniel 8 and 9 fit with Revelation? Uh, I, was, I was pleased to see we, we got uh, several questions about the book of Revelation, certainly since we spent, I don't know, 30-some weeks going through it just recently. <laughs> Still a couple of weeks to go. Uh, but uh, Daniel is a very interesting book and has a lot to do with what we see in the book of Revelation. And they were both written really for the same purpose, but to different audiences. And uh, the, the book of Revelation, as we know now, was written to the seven churches uh, there in Asia Minor uh, in the first century. And the purpose of that was to prepare the Christians to steal their faith, so to speak, uh, S-T-E-A-L, their faith, uh, so that they would be strong enough to go through the persecutions and that, the tribulation, as uh, John calls it, in the future. And Daniel was written for the same purpose, but Daniel's audience was uh, Israel in exile in Babylon. And you, you can imagine how their faith needed to be strengthened, because God had promised them that they were his people and all of these things. And now they've been captured. The temple's been destroyed. They've been taken from their country and placed down in this foreign country. And while in Babylon they didn't really undergo a lot of persecution for their faith, still it was not what they had imagined as followers of God. And so God has Daniel write this book to steal their faith for the coming persecution that's going to happen under a fellow by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now it won't happen for a couple three hundred years, but it's coming. And so God often deals with us in the same way. He's given us this book to strengthen our faith for things we're going to have to go through. And uh, we don't know what they are, but we know we go through various uh, difficult things. And so Daniel divides quite neatly. Uh, chapters 1 through 6 are historical. Daniel's telling us of various things that happened there in Babylon. That's where we get you know, the lion's den and, and the fiery furnace and, and those very familiar stories. Then verses 7 and following, or chapter 7 and following, is a series of visions. Just like John had a series of visions in Revelation. And what these visions are doing, they're telling, uh, revealing that there's going to be problems, there's going to be trouble, there's going to be strife, but Jesus is coming. And so they, they, they really focus on the fact that Je the first coming of our Lord to inaugurate the kingdom. Okay? Revelation focuses on the second coming of our Lord and the kingdom realized. Okay? When all the things are fulfilled, all things are made new. So that's kind of just briefly how Daniel and Revelation go together. That's, that's a really interesting explanation. didn't realize all that. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the next question is, what is the number of the beast? The Bible says 666. But the earliest copy of Revelation says it's 616. How come there's a difference? It's a good question. And I, I love these kinds of questions because they give us an opportunity to take a look not only at this question, but at how we need to view things and how we need to take in information. Uh, the reason this has come up in the last uh, few years is because of a thing known as the Oxyrhynchus papyri. And if you have that, you need to get a shot right away. <laughs> but th that's the, this is the whole problem, the oxyrhynchus papyri. What on earth is that? And, and why did that come up? Well, 
in uh, the 1800s, Oxyrhynchus, by the way, is a town in Egypt. Uh, and a papyri is a fragment from a, an old manuscript. It can be a biblical fragment or some other fragment. But the Oxyrhynchus papyri is a fragment from the book of Revelation uh, dated in the third century. And in it, now it's only about this big. It was discovered in the 19th century, but no, they could not read it because it was just uh, too, too mutilated in that. But uh, now, in the 21st century, uh, we have come up with this wonderful thing called multispectral imaging. And I really don't know what that is, except it's a fancy camera, I suppose, of some kind. But anyway, it allows them in the last few years to read that. And indeed, it does say 661 instead of 666. So, of course, people launch right onto that, as uh, there are folks out there that just love to take any opportunity to uh, disparage the scriptures or point out that this is wrong or that is wrong or whatever. So when you read about this, you read that scholars, and you always want to beware when you're reading something that was written by scholars, because they usually don't tell you who the scholars are, and they don't tell you the scholars' background and where they're coming from. And in this case, yes, they are scholars, in that they're learned men and women, but they're uh, most, mostly non-Christians and don't view the Bible at all as a book of God's writing. A couple of quotes from these, uh, these scholars. It doesn't make them bad folks. It just gives you an idea of where they're coming from. One of them said that the book of Revelation is thought to be written by John. Well, it's not thought to be written by John. It was written by John, you see. We know that. So that gives you a little clue. Uh, another clue is this. Uh, another scholar said this. It is, the book of Revelation is a critique of the politics and society of the Roman Empire. Well, it touches on that, yes, because that's the, uh, the scene it was written in. Uh, but that's not the point of the book of Revelation at all. So this is the background of these folks that are, are really jumping on this 616 bandwagon. Well, you'll re one of the things you'll remember in our study of Revelation, uh, we pointed out that there's really nothing new in the book of Revelation. It's simply an extrapolation of other things we find in the Bible, going clear back into the Old Testament and coming on through. Well, guess what? There's nothing new about... The 616. In fact, this issue was uh, really debated hotly a hundred years before the Oxyrhynchus papyri was written really? in the second century AD. This was a big issue because there were copies that said 616 rather than 666. So this issue had to be addressed and it was quite thoroughly and the man that led the charge was uh, a familiar friend of yours by the name of Irenaeus. <laughs> My, Mike loves these guys. He, he, he's in a class with me where we're yeah. going through all these old guys. He, he has a class. We're reading a book and the thing is I need him as an interpreter because it's so hard to read. It's written by a guy named Chadwick and uh, most of the people that are in the class with me, it's the morning, uh, uh, the, the Thursday morning men's group. It's extremely difficult to read. It's the, on the ancient history of the church and we thought it would be something simple, you know. Uh, of course, <laughs> I've actually learned that nothing in the Bible is simple <laughs> and particularly when somebody's trying to, to, to tell you and they're really smart because a lot of times they just talk over your head and uh, so I, I had to have an interpreter for that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, so the second century AD was a seminal century in the development of what we believe uh, today. Uh, it was a time when there was a lot of false information going along and God uh, gave us some really brilliant people to go through and sort this out and one of the top, uh, probably the number one guy at that time, was Irenaeus. Now, Irenaeus, uh, one of the reasons they, they, despair, they say this 616 manuscript is, uh, uh, holds some, some sway is because it's the oldest one that we have. Well, so they're using the argument that is a, an acceptable argument that the closer it is to the original, the more apt it is to be correct. Well, Irenaeus is a hundred years closer than this. Irenaeus was a disciple of a guy by the name of Polycarp. Some of you know that name. Polycarp was a disciple of John. So Polycarp got his information direct from the Apostle John. 
Irenaeus got his direct from Polycarp. And so they address this issue and let me share with you just a little bit about what Irenaeus wrote on this very issue a hundred years before you came down with Oxyrhynchus. He says this, as soon as I can find it here. He says, such then being the state of the case and this number 666 being found in the most approved and ancient copies of the Apocalypse and those men who saw John face to face bearing their testimony to it. While reason also leads us to conclude that the number of the name of the beast, if reckoned according to the Greek mode of calculation by the value of the letters contained in it, will amount to 666. I do not know how it is that some have erred following the ordinary mode of speech and have vitiated the middle number in the name, deducting the amount of 50 from it, so that instead of six decades, they will have it that there is but one. I am inclined to think that this occurred through the fault of the copyist, as is wont to happen, since numbers also are expressed by letters, so that the Greek letter which expresses the number 60 was easily expanded into the letter iota of the Greek language. So there you have the great Oxyrhynchus debate. And there's really not much to it because if you go back uh, to the original sources, they dealt with this issue and put it to bed a long time ago. Wow. The, you know, and it's, it's interesting to know that the arguments that, that we're having now have been argued that far back. That's one of the things we're learning from this Chadwick book. And, it's, it really is interesting to see all the things they're fighting over. Um, which will bring us to our next question, because this one's, this one's really kind of a core question, I think. What does it mean to fear God? Okay. Now, this is, this question, I put it after the Oxyrhynchus question for a reason. Because the Oxyrhynchus question turns on a scribal error, right? Just a, a change of one letter. Well, we're going to see how that comes up in this question. I want to read you the whole question uh, verbatim uh, the way I, I got it. Here, here it is. It says, Many verses in the Bible reference that we are to fear and be afraid of the Lord. Psalm 27, 1 is a good example. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom I shall fear. The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom I shall be afraid. We are also taught the Lord is compassionate and loving. This appears to be an oxymoron. Did the meaning of the words fear and afraid have a different meaning 2,000 years ago? Okay, so just kind of hang on to what, what you heard there. Uh, we'll get back to it. But fear in the Bible uh, has the same meaning it had today, but it's used a couple of different ways. Uh, in one sense, when, when we see fear used in the Bible, it's referring to fear like a a great awe, an ex a, 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 a great uh, fascination, um, something we're just overcome by the, the overpowering presence of this being. Okay? And then it has the, the other sense uh, of where you are afraid that something's going to happen to you, something bad's going to, to happen to you. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 10 three times told uh, the, uh, the disciples, fear not or do not be afraid. Now, he's talking using fear in the terms of something bad's going to happen to you. And, and we see that there. But then in Proverbs 1, 7, we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there he's using it in the sense of that we are awed by it. We are impressed with it. We are, we are so impressed with it that we wouldn't dare uh, to move out of place or anything. And John Piper had an interesting quote, and he, he says this about it. He says, the fear of the Lord means that you come reverently, humbly, without presumption, with awe and reverence. I think that's a good uh, definition of it. But then that begs the question, uh, how do we tell the difference? How do we know which fear is talking about? And that brings us to that thing we call context. And we do it all the time in the English language. We, we determine what a word means by how it's used in context. So that's kind of how we can tell which fear we're talking about. And uh, Martin Luther came up with a, a great remedy for this. If you know the, the history of Martin Luther at all, he, he would probably take the place as the man who was 
the most ever afraid of God. He was, he was just absolutely, and I mean fear in the bad sense. He just knew that he was going to hell and there was nothing he could do. There was no way he could get around it. And uh, in fact, he had a confessor uh, by, the, by the name of Johann von Staupitz. And von Staupitz became so exasperated with John coming to him every day, telling him what a wretched person he, John, was and how he could never get to heaven, von Staupitz resigned his position. He said, I can't listen to you anymore. You're depressing me. You know? Well, of course we know Luther, uh, through the study of the scriptures, determined that he was wrong and God is a gracious and loving God. So he came up with two terms uh, for this fear, which I, I think are good ones, and he calls it servile fear and filial fear. And of course, uh, servile fear is that fear that we're under the thumb of some tyrant and at any minute uh, blows could fall on us for getting out of line and that sort of thing. And then filial fear, as, as the, the word implies, is a family-like fear. It's like the, 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 the respect a son has for a father or, or a daughter for a mother or, or that. You know, we, when we're little and we look up to them and we just think, oh, this person can do anything, you know. My daddy can beat up your daddy type of thing. And so that's the difference, and we just need to determine from context uh, which fear is being uh, talked about. Oh, that's a great answer. Um, <clears throat> now that you've brought up family, let's talk about the next question. Where did Cain get his wife? Well, off the internet. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Where did Cain get his wife? This question just carries a perennial fascination for 20 and 21st century folks. And it's, it's often asked, asked a lot, and it's a good question. But here's something, oh, wait a minute, we gotta back up. I didn't answer one of the main questions I wanted to answer to in the fear of God question. Oh. Can we back up? Sure. Okay. I wanted to point out the scribal error in this question that totally changes the meaning of everything. And uh, we should have those two verses up there, maybe. But let me read you the question the way I received it. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom I shall fear. The Lord is the strength of my life, whom I shall be afraid. There's one letter that's out of place there that completely changes the meaning. Which letter is it? Aye. Aye. It should read, The Lord is my light and salvation, whom shall I fear? In other words, it's not the Lord I should fear, it's the Lord is on my side, whom sh should I fear? No one. Nothing. So you see how easy that is to do? And I do it all the time. I do it more with numbers than with letters. But, and also I've discovered, uh, someone told me this once, uh, and it's proven true in my life, you can't proofread your own work. Because once your brain registers it as saying one thing, you keep reading it that way no matter what it says. It's just one of the ways our brains work. So you can see how easy it would have been for somebody to miss that letter in 666 and change it to 616. It just happens. So that's a good example of how those things can happen. Okay. Now, we go. All right, back to the question about where Cain got his wife. Okay, okay, the big thing I want you to remember about this is this. You can never judge historical figures by contemporary standards. Okay? Remember that. In everything you read, every historical thing you ever check out, whether it's the Bible or not, you cannot judge historical figures or events by contemporary standards. Now, why is that important to where did Cain get his wife? Well, we will see. Uh, but, you know, no book gives us all the details. If, if this book gave us all the details, the Internet couldn't hold it. I mean, they're, you know, you know, any, any book you, you read, the author selects what he thinks you need to know, and that's what he tells you. The Holy Spirit selected what he thinks we need to know, and that's what he's told us here. But it still bugs us, doesn't it? Where did Cain get his wife? Well, in the beginning, God created. He created Adam and Eve, believe that, put them in the garden. It's like the Bible says. But he also, 
either created a lot of other people or Adam and Eve were very prolific, which is very possible because we know that people lived long lifespans in those days. We know that there were other people here because in Genesis chapter 4 verse 15, remember now Cain has slain Abel and he's all concerned that somebody's going to take revenge. And so um, God says, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. So there has to be other people. We don't know who, but I'm going to, I like to assume that they are descendants of Adam and Eve. If people lived hundreds of years in those times, you can have a lot of children and children and grandchildren in that length of time. So at any rate, there is a population on the earth other than just Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. There's also no biblical prohibition at this time against marrying your sister, your niece, whatever. Now, we are, it's so inculcated into us that that's not the thing to do. We just immediately think that's always been that way. But it's not so. And I'm not saying it is the thing to do because it's I believe it's still illegal, I don't know. But don't do that. <laughs> but in those days, it was acceptable. In fact, as you read scripture, Abraham married his half-sister. Rebekah was Isaac's niece. Two of Jacob's wives were his cousins. It was just an accepted thing to do. So the bottom line is, Cain's wife had to either be his sister or his niece. And again, don't judge that by what we set as moral standards. It's, it's the way it was. No. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the next question is, is one, I, you've explained this to me before, that's one of the reasons I gave it to you here, because I wanted it on tape so that I could write down all the places you go. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you've told me I don't have free will, and I, you know, I never have been able to follow you all the way through. So, can you explain why people do not have free will? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's an answer. Okay. But I'll tell you, I can tell you, I can tell you a little bit about what Scripture says. Okay. And by the way, I have witnesses. Your wife stood in my office this morning and said, "You don't have free will." She tells you what to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Okay, we could do a whole sermon series on this question and, and be there for many, many weeks. Uh, so we're going to really, really cut it down because as stated, the question is just too broad. We yeah. just can't do anything with it. So I want to first define free will. The essence of free will is to choose according to one's desires. Okay? We all make choices. And we make those choices based on what we desire. So the question really isn't, do we have free will? The question is, why do we choose what we choose? Why do we make these choices? Now I want to narrow it, though, even more than that. And I want to narrow it down to, there's two realms where we could talk about our will. There's the physical, and there's the spiritual. Now, the physical, that's a whole other question, and, and I can tell you about that someday we'll do a message on it and figure it out but for here for this morning I want to hold it to spiritually do we have free will spiritually and people are all over the map on that you know and so let's just let's look at it this way we have pre-fall and post-fall before the fall and after the fall before the fall Adam and Eve had, I believe, now there are people that will argue with this, but I believe uh, they had spiritual free will. They could choose to sin or they could choose not to sin. They're the only two people on this planet that have ever had that choice. Because what happened? They made the wrong choice, didn't they? And they sinned, and from then on, we are born as sinners. sinners. Now, anybody that's ever had children knows that. You know? I mean, I, I just get a kick out of people. They have these little babies, and they say, oh, they're so cute and so innocent. Baloney. <laughs> What's the first thing they do? First thing they do is learn to manipulate us by crying and doing this and doing that. And, and let me ask you parents. 
How many hours did you ever spend teaching your children to lie? <laughs> None. It just came naturally, didn't it? You, know? you didn't spend any time teaching them to steal. Now, I'm not saying they did, but you spent a lot of time hoping to prevent them from doing it by telling them. You see, we have a natural bent from the moment we're born to go the wrong way, to make the wrong choices. And, and so, uh, we're just born that way, and, and uh, that's the way it is. We call that original sin. Okay? So we're all born sinners, and therefore, uh, we just never make that right choice. Uh, we look at, at Genesis here, uh, chapter 2, verse 17. It says this, uh, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Okay, that's what God told Adam and Eve when he put them in the garden, right? The day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. But now, in ver chapter 3, verse 4, Satan enters the picture. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God says you will die. Satan says you will not die. Who is right? God. Well, you don't have to say it that quietly. It's God. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me then pose, pose another question. Did they die? Spiritually. Dead in their sins. They died spiritually, yes. They didn't die physically, they died spiritually. Okay. So we are spiritually dead. We're born spiritually dead. Every choice we make will be against God. We just don't vote for God in our spiritual condition. Now, thankfully... God intervenes. And in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 1 and 5, uh, it's pretty emphatic. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walked. Now, he doesn't say we were kind of dead, or we were a little dead, or we were mostly dead. We were dead. And then in verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So we were dead. Christ makes us alive. Romans 3. Uh, in, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've heard a lot about seekers. Seeker churches and seeker sensitive and all that sort of thing. Well, according to Scripture, there are no seekers. See? Romans 3 tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. So, there are seekers in the sense that people are seeking solutions to their problems, but they aren't seeking after God of, left to their own devices. I would simply ask you, you remember we've talked over the years about how uh, Scripture interprets Scripture, and when we have an ambiguous, ambiguity in Scripture, we go to the places where it is emphatic, and we let the ambiguity be defined by the emphatic. How much more emphatic can you get than you're dead? What have you ever seen a dead person do to help themselves? Nothing. Because they can't. Now, there are really three ways this has been viewed uh, theologically. Uh, the first, there was a British monk, 4th century, by the name of Pelagius. And Pelagius said... Uh, that no, you are born a uh, tabla rasa, blank slate, and it's totally up to you. You need no help from God, no intervention at all, and it, depending on how you live your life will determine whether you go to heaven or hell. And today we call that Mormonism. It's all about you, and you, by, by living a good, clean life, uh, you will get to heaven. Well, Augustine, uh, our great uh, forefather, he came along and he said, no, 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 no. That's not right. And pretty much people discounted Pelagius. Well, so then we have the, the second view, which we call semi-Pelagianism, or sometimes called Arminianism. Because uh, Arminius, uh, he came along in the uh, 16th century. He was a Dutchman. And he said, uh, well, we're, we're basically spiritually sick. And what we need is for God to help us, and then we'll be all right. So, what Arminianism says is, it's kind of like a prevenient grace type of thing. Uh, God puts this out there, and it's us to up, 
He puts his grace out there and it's up to us then to accept it or reject it. Now that sounds good to us because it's, it's, it just sounds like a fair way to do things. Uh, but uh, what sounds good to us isn't necessarily what sounds good to God. So the other view is what we call the Augustinian Calvinist view. Uh, Augustine in the 4th century, Calvin in the 16th century, which says, no, we don't move towards God at all. God comes to us and brings us into his kingdom. And, of course, that's, that's the view that, that I would hold to. And, of course, our great cry is that, wait a minute, that's not fair, right? That's what we want to say because we're all, we've got this fairness thing built into us. But you know what word's not in the Bible if you read it cover to cover? Fair. It's not there. Let me read for you uh, something here from Luke chapter 6. And I think it uh, does a pretty good job covering this issue. It's chapter 6, and we're going to look here at verses uh, 25 through 30. What did I do? Well, I wrote down the wrong verse here. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, how about, how about chapter 4, verses 25 through 30? Now, this is dealing with a fairness issue, and this is Jesus talking. He says, but in truth I tell you, and, and he's answering this very question that people had raised. He says, in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Could God not have cleansed all the lepers? Yes. Could God not have fed all the widows? Yes. Did God? No. Unfair, we cry. It didn't go over very big then either. Let me read on. <laughs> when they heard these things in the synagogue, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove Jesus out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. See, this has never been a popular thing with our human line of thinking. It just isn't. Uh, but it is what it is. And so, uh, in regard to salvation, we do not have free will. And that's why it says, you know, before he knew us, we were chosen? Mm hmm Oh, okay. I knew he... And, and that's not a real good explanation. I mean, it's a short time we have, so that could be another sermon series. Good. Because... That was, that was one of the things that is to try to get there because I, I remember you, you, you actually went to Genesis and you said something that in, in regards to are you oh hey there we go all right let's go to that one we'll skip we'll skip the next one and we'll go to number seven because that I think is going to answer the question I'm asking isn't it uh, are those who die in infancy saved are those who die in infancy, do those who die in infancy go to heaven? Yeah. Now there's a, there's a question that is another perennial one. People always ask that question. Uh, and the answer is, the Bible doesn't say. But it does give us a clue. And the clue is found in the story of David and Bathsheba, where uh, as a consequence of their sin, uh, the baby uh, from that union dies. And... Yeah, if you're familiar with the story, uh, the baby has, has been sick, and all the time he's been sick, uh, David has been inconsolable. He's been letting his hair go, he's not bathed, he's, he's been weeping and mourning. And so the, his attendants get word that the baby has died. And so they get together in a huddle, and they say, who's going to tell him? 
Because remember, in those days, a lot of times the messenger lost his head if the message wasn't well received. And uh, they were uh, conversing amongst themselves. Who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell him? Well, he overhears them. And he figures out what's happening. Now let me read this to you here. This is from 2 Samuel chapter 12. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that my child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Now here it is. I shall go to him but he will not return to me. Now our great clue there is David knows that when he dies he's going to be with the Lord. And if he's going to go to the child, the child must be with the Lord. So we can deduce from that that yes, those that die in infancy are the elect. And they do go to heaven to be with the Lord. And we will one day go to be with them. And I, I wish Scripture told us more about that subject, but it does not. But we can take great solace in knowing what David said, and that, I believe, is the way it is. And we're going to run out of yeah. time. That's, yeah, we're, we're at a point where we basically have to quit, but, you know, I don't know how many of you... Uh, uh, are interested in, in hearing more in regards to these. Um, I, I think they're, you know, but uh, if you do, just, just let us know and uh, we can continue the series. All right, good.